So let's get this started. Seems like it's bouncing back at me here, Roger. <coughs> um, but before we do that, I want to do a bit of a review and make sure we all understand where we are. So this is this chart that I've put up several times already. The seals are broken. When the seventh seal is broken, it reveals seven trumpets. When the seventh trumpet blows, it reveals seven bowls of wrath. And where we are tonight is where that arrow is pointing, and that is to the fifth trumpet, and that's chapter 9. But I've also wanted to uh, kind of summarize where we've, where we've gone so far, and at least where I think, at least where I am, with the book of Revelation up to this point. And you might remember that when John is told to write down what he sees, that is, he says, what now is and what will be. And so part of the revelation is a description of the present tense of John's time. And the rest of it is going to be future prediction. And so I've tried to boil down where we've been already with whether it's now or then. And maybe some of this may, may be opinion or not. I don't think so. The seven churches of Asia are both. Part of the letter to each church is, go, is what's going on at that time. It usually starts with the words, I know. And Jesus describes what's going on. But in each letter there's also a predictive element. Something dealing with the future. And so the letters to the seven churches are both. The question to answer is uh, for us in my answer to it, it may not be right, is that the seven churches are representative of all the churches at the time, using the number seven as the perfect number, because there were more than seven churches in Asia at the time. Then we come to the seals. So God has the, the scroll in his hand, it's sealed, and so we start breaking those seals because we found the lamb who's worthy to do it. And I put seals 1 through 5a, isn't that kind of interesting, as the now, and then 5b, and the rest as the then. Why do I, why do I split seal 5? Because it is both. It's first, it first says, John says, I saw those who were martyrs. Those who were killed because of their faithfulness or the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's a noun. But they ask the question, how long is this going to go on? And so he gives future. And in essence says it's going to be finished at some time in the future. So five, five is both now and then. Well, if we're not confused yet, okay. So the seventh seal is opened. And as we mentioned earlier, that reveals trumpets. And so the trumpets are going to blow. Trumpets 1 through 4, which we had last week and we'll review quickly in a moment, are, are then. Not a now, but a then. What's, what's going to happen? Then you have this eagle announcement at the end of chapter 8. We'll go into that here in just a moment. And the eagle fundamentally announces three rows. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And that's the last three trumpets, 5, 6, and 7. And those are, those are going to be categorized under then also, or later if you don't like the word then. And so that's the three roles. Okay, so let's take a step back for just a moment to those first four trumpets. First four trumpets. As with the four seals, the first four seals are lumped together, so are the first four trumpets. Now last week I was hurrying to get three chapters done and I didn't do it and I got pretty fast at the end, plus it rained on us and it was loud. So I just want to do this brief review before we move forward tonight. You got, you got the four trumpets and here's what they do. 
they announced impact on the world in various areas. And we're not going to go back and read that again, but there's impact, <coughs> there's things that are going to impact the world, and that, uh, that Rome was already known for being impacted throughout their history by calamities like this. And so they're using those type of calamities to look forward into the future to say, it, there's going to be things like that, but it's not like that. But these are symbols for, for what's going to happen. Okay, then, <clears throat> then, in John's day, the world was classified according to these things. And I put land and land and sea and water and heavenly bodies. And that was just the way they considered the world made up of those things and in these four trumpets each one of those is impacted each one of them so we, we look then at this third one third partial judgment so in each one of these a third of something was was impacted and we, we pointed out that this is still the use of the number three even though it's a fraction indicating that God is going to allow some time to repent before complete judgment happens. And just to point some of that out, if you have your Bibles open, we can go to the, the end of chapter 9 for just a moment. Now that's, this is going to be after Trump, trumpet uh, 5 and 6 have done their thing. But he says here in chapter 9 and verse 26, the or verse 20, excuse me, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see, hear, or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And, and then I uh, uh, pointed out that an opportunity to repent has always been God's way to act. He will either bring or threaten a judgment and say, okay, you know the solution to this. You need to repent. Unfortunately, they didn't. And so the northern kingdom was, was taken by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom was taken by the Babylonians because they didn't repent. This is the way God works. For God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The problem with that is so many people aren't walking according to the will of God. And so this is, uh, this is what those first four trumpets uh, are all about. And let me put up this, uh, this from Revelation 13 as, the, as chapter 8 ends. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in mid-air call out in a loud voice, Lo, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. So as the last three trumpets sound, as we'll get here in chapter 10, it's going to be worse than the first four. And the first two woes are pronounced, we are given the end of those woes. We're not the third. And so maybe it's something still going. Well, I don't, I don't think so. So this, this then brings us in to chapter 9. I think I pointed out that every version uses the word eagle here except the King James and the New King James. They use the word angel. Either way, the pronouncement is lo, lo, lo. And that's, uh, that's our urgent consideration here. So now we, we can go to... Uh, well, I want, to remind it, I want to remind you of this, what we covered in the very first lesson about the principles of interpretation. When a, when, the, when a book in the Bible is written, it must have had some meaning for the people to whom it was written. That's called application or context. It must have had some, some kind of meaning for the people to whom it was written. Number two, most of this book should be regarded as symbolic, which makes it different from every other book practically, every other book in the Bible, which we would take, uh, we would take those books literal, with maybe some symbolism in them, but the book of Revelation is symbolic and should be regarded that way. 
If the interpretation of a symbol or vision is given, let it stand as the correct one. We don't necessarily need to enlarge on it, change it, or say it's wrong. And some of the some of uh, interpretation is given us in some cases. And remember I said, do not try to make every detail fit or have meaning in every vision. John is writing what he sees. And he's, some things are just part of what he sees. They don't in and of themselves have any meaning but to complete a picture. So keep those things in mind that we've talked about. And let's blow the fifth and sixth trumpet. So we blow trumpet number five. Are you chapter nine, Revelation? Mm -hmm. Here we go. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and we'll read in just a moment what came out of that. So I just read the first uh, two verses in chapter 9 of Revelation, and the fifth trumpet blows. And what happens? This is the first woe. Okay, this is the first woe. There's a fallen star. Is there any doubt who that fallen star is? Surely not. In case you're wondering, <laughs> did someone say the Apostle Paul? No, okay. Uh, if in case you're wondering, go to verse 11. We'll just go get ahead of ourselves here, okay? This this plague that, of locusts that hits in, in, with the blowing of the fifth trumpet has a king over them. They have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is called Apollyon. Now do we have any doubt about who that fallen star is? There's only one person that those descriptions fit, and that's Satan. That is Satan. Okay, so that it's a fallen star, and he's Satan. I want to spend a moment on the significance of being a fallen star. And we go to several several scriptures in the Bible that, that point that out for us. 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held in judgment. Fallen angels. As a matter of fact, that passage goes on to say, and if he didn't spare the whole world except Noah, Okay, so he, he points those things out. Of course, he's pointing out that to say, you know, God can save us too. He's in that business. You haven't done anything so bad you can't be saved. That's his point. But he says there was angels that fell from heaven. Jude will say the same thing. Jude will say, then the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, isn't that an interesting statement? Didn't keep their positions of authority? but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he is kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So we read these two verses, and we assume, okay, they're talking about Satan getting caught up in that and being cast out of heaven. We go to the book of Luke. This is interesting. The 70 have gone off to do the uh, limited commission, that we call it, and they've come back and they're reporting to Jesus what they did. And the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us, don't forget those last three words, in your name. So it wasn't in their name that they were casting out demons. It was in the name of Jesus Christ. That, by the way, that's the only way you could do it. Jesus responds and says something pretty strange. I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. He doesn't say, good job, boys. He says... This was a defeat to Satan. Mm -hmm. Your ability to cast out demons in my name is a defeat of Satan. And he uses as an example the way Satan was cast out of heaven. You see what I'm saying? So Satan was cast out of heaven, so that becomes an image. And it becomes an image that reflects the def when Satan is defeated. Now my... my Imagination runs away with me here, okay? <clears throat> Every time a person is baptized into Jesus Christ, Satan is defeated. Why don't I get an amen there? Amen. Every time a person is baptized into Jesus Christ, Satan 
is defeated. And I wonder if the angels in heaven and Jesus Christ himself say, and I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In my most uh, ambitious moment, I call this a heavenly high five. Okay, high five in each other. Because we got another one and Satan lost one. Now we can go to another, I'm spending way too much time on this. Uh, we can go to Isaiah, we read this passage. How, are you, how you are fallen from heaven, O day star. King James Version says, Lucifer, son of God. How are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? Interesting that this would be a, a pronunciation against Babylon, or Assyria, excuse me, Syria. So using the image of maybe Satan falling from heaven, he talks about how that that country, that whole nation, is going to be taken down. Of course, we know who they were instruments of, do we not? Being instruments of Satan. So that's enough there about this fallen angel. I wanted to point out <clears throat> that it's not the first time the devil has been mentioned in Revelation. He's mentioned with all, all of those uh, churches of, uh, in Asia in, in chapters 2 and 3. And <clears throat> notice that the synagogue of Satan is mentioned twice. As well as Satan's throne and the deep things of Satan to the church of Thyatira. That is in contrast to the morning star. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. Notice we're almost at the end of the book here. And I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. In direct contrast to Satan. That star that fell from heaven. It's a good thing the book ends this way. Okay, let's keep going. Then we have the shaft of the abyss or the bottomless, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> whatever your, however your, your version reads. And that's, that's the, if you please, the domain or the area of authority for Satan. And there's different ways that that's mentioned in different, in different scriptures. And it's, it's referred to again in the book of Revelation. Chapter 17 will be kind of interesting when we get there, when we talk about uh, Satan and being thrown into the bottom of the pit and all that kind of stuff. But we'll talk about it when, when we get there. But it is the realm of Satan. And he is described by both a Hebrew word and a Greek word to be a destroyer. He's a destroyer. Satan doesn't have to kill you. All he has to do is destroy you. Whether it's your influence or your life or whatever. That's really all he has to do. That is the realm of Satan, but God controls it. Not Satan. God does. And we'll find that, we'll find that mentioned, mentioned later on. And then the plague begins. The plague of the, of the fifth, uh, fifth trumpet. First it appears as smoke off in the distance. Just read all that. We don't have time to read everything tonight, but we'll read this. Okay, so we're, we're concluding uh, verse 2 the, from the bottom. Speed, and from the shaft rose smoke, yep. like the smoke of a... Microphone that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, hey, we got it. Where would my man go here? I'm the sub. You're the sub, okay. <laughs> In the meantime, I'll kind of talk loud. And from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened. And my unit is still on, so I don't know what's on here. It's much. Okay. Uh, Then verse 3, from the smoke came locusts on the earth. Now, was it smoke or was it locusts? And they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant and any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people... People will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from him. You want to try to just turn it off, turn it back on? We reboot, we reboot anything, don't we? Yeah. That's, that's what it takes. 
the smoke and then the locusts. I, I, tell, I, I share this with you and tell you how old I am every time I come to this passage here in, in, in uh, Revelation. Watch your ears. I got my ears. We're back on. We're back on. Okay, let me reread all that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> there is, did you ever watch the show Rifleman? Did you ever watch that old show? There's an episode where uh, Luke and Mark, his, his son, are on a train, and and the train has stopped. It's not running. It, it quit running, and so they look off in the distance, down the track, out on the horizon, and they see what they call smoke. And as that smoke gets closer and closer and closer to them, you know what it was? grasshoppers. It was grasshoppers. And they got the train started, but the grasshoppers died so much on the on the track, they couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get going. Well, the rifle man wasn't here in chapter 9, but, okay, but you see this smoke, and then when they get a clear shot at what comes out of the smoke, it's locusts. It's locusts. And if you read enough Old Testament, you know that locusts, I was going to say pop up, I guess they fly up, fly up quite a bit. But first it appeared as smoke, as smoke, it darkened the sky, I'll share with you now, that's the concept for sin, darkness, okay. and the locusts descend. Now they're described this way, that like, they're like horses prepared for battle, and we're not going to read uh, verses 7 uh, through 11, we just don't, we don't have time to do that, but that comes from verse 7. If you want to read through that as I'm giving you this description, you can do that. Their horses prepared for battle. By the way, if they're prepared for battle, what are they going to do? They're going to fight. They're going to attack. They're powered to attack. Something like gold crowns, which is now the power of authority. By the way, the crown is a Stephanos crown, the crown of conquer, the crown of victory. Not the diadem, which is the crown of ruler, rulership. They have the Stephanos crown. They had the face of men, so they were they had intelligence. They had long hair like women's. And that's the power of physical beauty, <laughs> but I've got to tell you, my wife knows all these stories. <laughs> so we're going to move from the rifleman to Star Trek. Okay, everybody remember Star Trek? Okay, okay. In one particular episode, and of course he's on one of these planets anyway, but, uh, and I forget what the issue is, but all of a sudden the camera moves from Captain Kirk to a woman. And you see her, and she's, you know, from the back, she's, she's lovely, she has this long hair, and of course he has to go up to the woman, right, and turns her around, and boy, is she ever more than ugly, all right, I mean, she, she has like this trumpet for a mouth, and all that. anyway, it's kind of, kind of weird, okay, and that may be what's going on here, there is an attraction here, do you think that Satan wouldn't like to attract you before he gets you? I'm sure he does, okay. The teeth of lions, there's the destruction, the breastplate of iron, the power of invincibility, they thought. Okay? And the sound of chariots. So there's a, there's a sound of war right there, and, and it, it, it generates fear. Remember when the Israelites were at the Red Sea and, the, and they heard the sound of the chariots of Egypt coming up behind them? It generates fear. Scorpion tells. You ever been stunned by a scorpion? My wife has any number of times. I'd love to tell about it. Does it hurt? Will it kill you? And that depends on if you watch. Uh, there's another television show. Who's, who's the uh, the deputy in Dallas? Uh, uh, he, and he advertises those exercise machines. Walker. Yeah, him. He got stung by some really bad scorpions, but he didn't die either. The results. The results of the scorpion attack. It's a five-month plague. Using the number five is, I, here, here, I don't think it's technical, other than it's about how long a locust plague lasts. Okay, it was, five, it was five months. They didn't inflict death, they just made things very painful. And they could do nothing to those sealed by God. They couldn't kill them. This gives, this gives the purpose of the sealing back in chapter 7. When, when those of God's uh, number were sealed, they couldn't harm the grass. You know what that tells me? Then this is a symbolic locust plague, not a literal one. Because guess what the first thing is locusts eat? 
and the green grass and the leaves, the very thing the locust plague would decimate. Men will seek death. Death would be better than what they are experiencing. So that's that's the blowing of the trumpet. That's the description of the plague. So what are the conclusions? We're not predicting a literal locust plague here, as it says no green things are going to be eaten. The plagues come from the realm of Satan. They come up out of that abyss or whatever your, whatever your Bible calls it, but it's following the will of God. I put Galatians 6, 7, and 8 out there because we all know that passage, right? Can anyone quote it? It means you're going to follow whoever's will you're following, whether it's God's or whether it's Satan, right? Whether it's God or whether it's Satan. The persecuted Christians will not be harmed. That is, those who are not living according to the flesh. I put Romans 8 in there, but we're not going to go there. The description of the locusts are the very things in which Rome took pride and arrogance in. Their cavalry, their army, everything that a, a nation like Rome would need to both conquer and remain strong. The locusts represent all of that. And we have, we've already talked about Abaddon and the Palladian. This is the beginning of the end. This tells me, uh, once again, or this, let me share with you, this, this speaks to what I believe Revelation is about. It's, part of it is about what's going on at the time John wrote it, and part of it's about what's going on in the future. What's going to happen in the future is beginning with this particular vision. Okay, whenever this happens, this is going to be the beginning, beginning of the end. The very things that Rome took pride and security in are the very things that will begin to bring her down. And that's not only true of Rome, that's true of any country. Most countries are not brought down by another nation. They bring down themselves, and then they're easy picking. They're easy picking for anybody. History points out that her, that is Rome's fall, from, was from within. We don't have time to go to Judah 1, but in judgment on Judah, you have locusts. As a matter of fact, before we, he described the locust plague, he, he says, you're about to see something that's never been seen before. And there are four stages of the locusts that he goes through. And then he begins to give the reason why there's going to be a locust plague. And you understand, well, the plague is a symbol of God's judgment uh, on people. Okay, now we get to the sixth trumpet and the second roll. Now look there in chapter 9 real quick. And you have, in verse 12, you have the first roll has passed. Behold, two rolls are still to come. So trumpet 5, the first roll. Now we have the sixth angel. Let's read a few verses from that one, beginning in verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. Wait a minute, have we had a golden altar yet? Well, we've had an altar, so it must be a golden one, right? Before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released. Now that's pretty definitive timing, by the way. Okay. And remember we had four angels earlier who were held back. But now we have four who are released. Released to do what they're going to do at the time that they're going to do. And you look at the end of verse 15, kill a third of mankind. We'll read some more, more in a minute, but let's look. Four angels are now unrestrained. They're about to carry out what they were intended. And they're commanded by a voice from the altar and they're prepared for the task in time, an hour, day, month, and year. As we keep reading then, this is the army. So the four angels, verse 15, who've been prepared for the hour, the day, month, year, to kill third mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. Well, what is 10,000 times 10,000? Come on, mathematicians. So what's twice that? No way. This is the use of the numbers 10, okay, 10 times 10, in a very extensive, uh, in a very extensive way. In other words, there's a lot of them. Okay, there's a lot of them. I heard the number, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. 
they were here we go again breastplates the color of fire and sapphire and sulfur and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths and by these three plagues a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the sulfur coming out of their mouths and for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails for their tails are like serpents with heads and by means of them they wound if anybody wanted to would you draw me a picture of this and put in all this detail if I saw one of these things, the last thing I would think is that it was a horse. Mm -hmm. But that's what it says. And so, they have horses and riders. Here's your, here's your uh, colors used again. Fire red, dark blue, sulfur yellow. We'll talk about that in a minute. Lion's heads on the horses. Fire, smoke, and sulfur from their mouths. I'll take you to Genesis 19. You know what Genesis 19 is all about? The destruction of Sodom. And Gomorrah. Tails were like snakes. And the river Euphrates. And I mentioned the Parthians to the east. The Parthians are, are going to be a, a problem, kind of an ongoing problem for the Rome. And I take you back to, uh, uh, to chapter 6 and that first horse and rider dressed in white and all that. And I think that is a, that's a warrior. And I think he's dressed like one of these. Now, and as I said, some people think that's Jesus, and that's fine, uh, but that's just not where I am there. We can also look at Isaiah 8 and 7 and Jeremiah 6 too, with respect to the river Euphrates. Uh, Therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of Euphrates, the king of Assyria, with all his pomp. It will overflow its channels, run all over its banks. He's comparing the onslaught from Assyria to the Euphrates River in flood stage. And it's used that way in Babylon later on. And so Euphrates to, tends to be a time for invasion to start, as, as it's used in the Bible. And it runs all over its blanks. I, I call it the 200 million man march. You remember the million man march, wasn't it, under Dr. King on uh, Washington, D.C.? Well, I call this the 200 million man march. A third of mankind is killed, and this is, this is of God. He's only going to permit so much to, to happen there. You have the plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur, and that's God's judgment. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, how judgment was brought on them. The purpose was repentance. We read the last two verses in chapter 9 just a while ago. The purpose was repentance. Our God is a God of giving somebody a chance to repent, but... The evil continues. Demon worship, idolatry, murders, magic arts, immorality, and robbery. And, and so the, uh, sixth, uh, the sixth trumpet, blow, the sixth angel blows his trumpet, and then we come, then we come to uh, one of these breaks in the action. Don't you just hate it when you're watching a football game and it gets real exciting and they got to go to a commercial? Okay, well this is chapter 10. So we're going we're gonna to have to move right on to chapter 10. And I've got to draw some conclusions first from this. Number one, Rome will fall. Why? Because God says so. Because God is God. All right? She will be easy prey for invasion because of being weakened by calamities and internal decay. God is at work to bring about repentance primarily without repentance and godly sorrow there's judgment and that's what's going to happen here this is a quote running like a thread through the entire work by Gibbon and Gibbon's work is the decline and fall of the Roman Empire have you read that? if you've read that you have too much time on your hands it's long and hard the decline of the Roman Empire, there's this thread that runs through the whole thing, is the truth that three great things combined to overthrow the Roman Empire. They were partly working in John's day. The three were natural calamity, internal rottenness, and external invasion. And maybe in that order, to bring down Rome. And I think that's being pictured for us right here. Chapter 10, the angel with the little scroll. So, so we're, we're done with six. <laughs> that red arrow is right between them. We're, we're done with six, but not quite the seven. Okay? So we have that angel 
with that little with that little scroll. All right, let's read real quickly. Then I saw. Let me check my time here. Oh, we're doing awful. Okay. <laughs> Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun. I'm going to skip all of this. It's a little bit. Go down to verse 5, or uh, verse 4. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Who created heaven and what is in it, and the earth is what is in it, and the sea what is in it, that there would be no more delay. This is this is in answer to the question those martyrs asked back in chapter six, seal five A. That's the question, right? Yeah. How long? Okay. So we have a mighty angel, that's from a position of strength, came down from heaven, not from the abyss, not from the bottom of the spirit. He came from heaven. We know he's on the good guy's side. He's robed in cloud. Look, just read through these quickly. He's robed in a cloud. He's a rainbow above his head. He's a face like the sun. He had legs like a fiery pillar. Held a little scroll. Does that sound familiar to you? Of anything we read in the book of Revelation so far? Forget the scroll part. Isn't it similar to the picture of Jesus in the middle of the golden lampstands in chapter 1? It's very similar. So what we have in this angel, I think, this mighty angel, is a representation of Jesus. Not Jesus, but a representation of Jesus. And he had a scroll. Back in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 5, God had that scroll, or chapter 4, God had that scroll in his hand. Well, this little angel has a scroll in his hand. The right foot is on the sea, the left foot is on the land. This is why I hurried up. This is chapter 13. Chapter 13, we can turn over and read that if you want to, but don't do it, we don't have time. There's two beasts. One came out of the earth, one came out of the sea. The two beasts represent the authority and power of the Roman Empire, and that's where this angel is standing. One foot on the earth and one foot on the sea, and there's more power there than there is in those two beasts. They came up out of one out of the sea and one, one out of the earth. Now, I refer you to those symbols and in chapter 13. As you can tell, I'm anxious to get to chapter 13. How long can we stay here tonight? Well, no. Okay, so there's, there's that angel. Well, what about, what about that angel? He has a scroll. It's a little scroll. It's a little scroll, a message related then to the overall message of the big scroll. Okay, it's a, or a subset of a larger scroll. It's in the hand of the angel from God. So this is another message from God. And it's open. It's open. This one's not sealed. It's open. It's ready, ready to be revealed. The time is now. This thing is, is right now with respect to when John is. It's eaten by John. We didn't read all this. I'm going to go ahead and get through this. It's eaten by John. And he says it is sweet to his mouth and it's sour to his stomach. It's sweet to his mouth, as God's word always is. As that's my little commentary there. It's sour in its stomach. It can have harsh results. We have a very similar thing in, in Ezekiel 2, 9, verse, uh, through, uh, 3, 3, which is God's message to Israel. And a similar thing is said to Ezekiel as he eats a scroll. Because it had bad news. Bad news for God's people. But he ate it, and it too was sweet to his mouth. Once again, we can point out symbols and illustrations that are not new to the book of Revelation. The message of the scroll is from God for John and will have very potent, very potent results. So that's the, the angel and the scroll. The thunders speak in reaction to the angel's roar. We didn't read that part, but it's, it, it, it's in here. The thunders speak in reaction to the angel's roar. Can you imagine an angel roaring? Yeah. Anybody who needs to go pick up kids, you need to go do that right now. The roar shook the very portals of heaven. The seven thunders speak. There's a complete message. Seven. John heard the message. We heard the voices speak. John prepared to write. He understood the message. And John then was commanded not to write it. 
because it wasn't time. It wasn't time for this message. Uh, and I refer you to uh, the end of the book, Revelation 2.10, when, when you're, we are encouraged to not seal up the message of what we call the book of Revelation because the time is now. Now we can go to the Old Testament again and see, well, old Daniel, Daniel talks up here a lot. But Daniel was given a message and it concerned the distant future. And so he was told to seal it up. And we're, and we're told that in two places in Daniel, uh, Daniel 8 and Daniel 12. So sealing it up means not yet. If it's open, it's ready. It's time. Okay, there will be no more delay, we just read in 10.6. That's the answer to the question of 6.10. And God has communicated this before. You can either go to 6.11, we won't do that, or Daniel 2, which is where you are Saturday morning, if I understand right, in the Saturday morning class. What happens in Daniel 2? The vision of that, that whatever you call it, statue that had the different levels of things that, you know, that made it. And finally that statue is hit on the feet by a stone that comes out of heaven, which is the kingdom of God, which I'll never, and it just tells us, boom. Not only is Rome going to be gone, but Rome's going to take down the Greek nation, and the Greeks are going to take down the Medo-Persian nation, and the Medo-Persians are going to take down the Babylonians, the Babylonians took down the Assyrians. So that's, uh, that's what that's all about. It will happen in the days of the seventh trumpet. So, let's begin reading, uh, once again in, in verse 7. But that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophet. All right. I may want to come on Saturday morning when y'all get to Daniel 9, Daniel 10, Daniel 11, and hear what you have to say about that. Do the prophets predict the downfall of Rome? The answer to that is yes. They did. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. Boy, would you tell an angel that? Give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your mouth, your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy, depending on what version you have, about many people, or before many people, and nations and languages and kings. Then we, as we move in into, into chapter 11, we have more of this interlude, more of this pause, than the seventh trumpet is not blown till the end of chapter 11. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that trumpet, but I think I have enough time to get us through the rest of chapter 11, which you could pick up as next week's lesson, but, uh, but we're going to do that. So the first thing that happens in chapter 11, I'm just going to forget that, is he's told, he's told to measure the temple, but not to measure the court of the Gentiles, or yours may say something different, the outer court. And so I put this uh, depiction of the temple area, where I, met, where I point out you have a court of women, a court of men, you have a court of priests, and then the court of the Gentiles, and this is also the court of the Gentiles. It was on both sides. And so he's told, don't count these. As a matter of fact, now, just thinking about this in, in, in other biblical place, uh, passages, the court of Gentiles is the, probably the place where the people were selling and, and Jesus kicked over everything. The court of women is probably where Jesus saw the woman who gave all that she had. The court of the men, who cares what happened there? And then the court of the priest, obviously, the only place people who could go beyond here would be the priests. I'm pointing that out to go ahead and point out that the sanctuary that John is told to measure is the naos. And that's the inner sanctuary. That's the place of the holy place and most holy place and everything in front of it. The entire temple area is, is named by the Greek word eron. So when it's here alone, it's the entire temple area, but if you're talking just about that place where only the priest could go, that's what he's measuring. The holy place and the most holy place, and not the court of the Gentiles. 
The inner sanctuary is the dwelling place of God. You remember the temple and the tabernacle, do you not? The Ark of the Covenant under the most holy place, the, uh, the mercy seat and the, the, the angels and the smoke appearing as, as God was present. That represented the dwelling of God. It's going to be preached a while and we'll be done. The New Testament church is the temple of God today. I thought I might get an amen on that. The New Testament church is the temple of God. Jesus entered that sanctuary. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Once for all, just quoting for Hebrews chapter 6. But here you go. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together, you together are that temple. This is the collective use of the word temple to describe the Lord's church. Collectively, we are a temple of God. However, you can also in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. Individually, individually we're a temple of God. Collectively we're a temple of God. There's, there's got to be a lesson there somewhere, right? That God dwells in us and in his temple. The Hebrews passage, we have this hope as an anchor of the soul, firm and secure. Why? It enters the inner sanctuary, behind the curtain, where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Measuring the temple, this bottom section, measuring the temple with the reed is showing how God's people measure up to the standards, number one, and that God identifies them as he is. Seven third, uh, chapter 7 verse 3 and 4 was the sealing of God's people having the name of God on their forehead so from chapter 11 don't bother measuring the Gentiles don't bother doing that there's no sense don't measure their court as Jews represent the church we're talking symbolically here as Jews represent the church the Gentiles represent those not the church we're not saying gen no Gentiles ever became Christians. That's missing the point. In symbolic language that's used here, Jews represent the church, God's people. Gentiles represent those who are not. We've already seen it in the book of Revelation. As when the people were numbered and had, or had the name of God on their forehead and were given what is supposedly a list of the tribes of, of Israel. We know it's not, but that's used to represent God's people. They will, uh, there's no need to measure what obviously will not measure up those, uh, those that are not God's. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. And now we talk about the way some time is measured. 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days, time, times, and a half time all mean the same thing. All of them are half of seven. All of them for half of seven. And you can you can get your calculator out and do it, but three and a half years is forty-two months. Twelve hundred and sixty days, well that's forty-two months times thirty days in a month. And time times and a half time. It's all saying the same thing. If anything is measured by that, it means it's not over. It's incomplete. We're waiting for the seven. We may never see the number seven but we will see completeness. So if anything is lasting for three and a half years, that's not the end of the story. Daniel is really good at using these numbers, but the book of Revelation is too. So what the Christians are experiencing is not the end of the story. There is more before it is complete. And we will be getting into more and more of that. Then this chapter has these two olive trees and two lampstands and, and who are these witnesses and, and all of that. And I, I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail here. And I'm not even going to go through this. There's all kinds of ideas about these two guys and you can read them in, your, in, your, in the Bible later on. But here I am. 
represented by two olive trees and two lampstands. See Zechariah 4, which you go home and read that. But the point is, when these two guys die and then are revived, then are raised, the point is the will of God may appear to be stopped, but the gates of hell will not prevail against it. They come back to life. And they can continue their preaching. And so that this section ends uh, in a very in a very interesting way. Well, it's not really the end. The two are eventually killed in Sodom, Egypt, and Jerusalem. How can they be killed in three different places? They are being killed in a place that looks like these. That looks like these. So he says, look in verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called, symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt and where their Lord was crucified. You put those three cities together and guess what you come up with? Rome. You come up with Rome. And for three and a half days, some from the people in tribes and language of all nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. So the uh, bodies are viewed, but there's no burial. People rejoice over their death, but they live again, and they're taken to heaven, and that causes terror and earthquakes, 7,000 people killed, natural calamities, and some people actually give glory to God. I'm going to go back over that a little bit next week as I get to the seventh trumpet. So the anticipation is that we will review that, finish chapter 11. Chapter 12 is one of my favorite chapters in Revelation. I don't know if I can run through that one very quick, but we'll try. But it's followed by another favorite chapter, chapter 13. But we'll, we'll work all of that in there as, as we can. What we have seen so far in the fifth and sixth trumpet, which are the first and second woe, is you might say a completion of judgment. A completion of judgment. And, and because of that, the seventh trumpet blows and it's, it's praise, it's honoring God. Uh, so anyway, I think we'll stop there tonight Victor, thank you for getting the speaker working. Where do you go?